All right, guys, I'm here at SpaceX in the Tesla Design Center, and we got the new FST Beta 11.4. Let's go test it out. Take me to La Venta Inn. All right, so we got the destination, and let's go. Good smooth offsetting with the pedestrian there. Now we got a left turn. We're in the SpaceX Tesla Design Center parking area. And it ran that stop, which is written on the road. There was no stop sign there but uh, there was stop written on the road, but it did not honor that. But that's an issue that's been in previous builds as well. All right, we got an unprotected left here. Very nice. It looks like there's a pedestrian crossing the street. It's slowing down appropriately. There we go. And then there were some more people crossing the street, but it didn't slow down overly for them, which is good. I've noticed this version is a lot better at continuing when there's pedestrians that are not in your way. So, you know, like they were just starting to cross the street. They were far away, but past versions might have slowed or stopped for them, even though they were, you know, 15, 20 seconds away and the car will be long gone by then. But now this version is much better at realizing that, okay, I can be out of there before they're here and just not uh, controlling for it, which can be pretty annoying. Okay, almost went into the right turn lane by mistake, but then it corrected itself. That wasn't uh, so smooth, but at least it got in the right lane. Just did it a little late. I guess it thought that lane could continue forward. Right now it wants to change lanes. It's really free and clear to change the lane. There's no reason why it can't right now. And there we go. I think maybe there was this other car two lanes over. So often it won't make a lane change if there's a car passing two lanes over, which seems a little silly. I guess there's probably some uncertainty about which lane it's in, or maybe they could change lanes or something. All right, and we're gonna be continuing on this road for a while. Next right turn is gonna be in 4.4 miles for Delamo Boulevard. going to be pretty boring. Maybe I should have picked a more interesting drive to do. But I guess we can just talk about FSD and stuff. So maybe it doesn't matter if it's uh, boring or not. But, you know, I don't think I've had any, like, safety critical takeovers on 11.4.1 yet, or really any takeovers at all. Um, it's just been doing everything just fine. I haven't needed to take over. And uh, even the past uh, version, 11.3.6, was doing really good for me. I just posted a video yesterday where it drove six hours without takeover from San Francisco to LA. And the really interesting thing to me was how I started on Chestnut Street in San Francisco. Tons of stopped cars, tons of traffic. And I navigated all the way through San Francisco, going through the parked cars and pedestrians and handling all of it without any input required. No speed changes, no accelerator presses, no lane change requests with the turn signal, 
no lane change cancel. Just, it just did it, right? And, I mean, do you remember when Elon and the Tesla team first started saying, well, you'll be able to take an existing Tesla and it'll take you start to end, no input required. And people said this was a fantasy, they said it was a fraud, and now it's happening. It literally is doing all of my drives without me taking over. Now, is it 100% perfect? No. Is it ready for robo-taxi? No. There's still quite a bit of things to work out, um, smooth out. I mean, this version has its typical new version roughness. But the debate about whether this is possible or not is over in my view. It is actually possible to drive a car with computer vision. And, you know, you might say, well, it doesn't work in my area yet. And that, you know, that's true. Uh, the challenge is really getting it to work everywhere, of course. But if it can work here in California, it can work all over the world. Okay, so this is an interesting situation where it's not going because of this guy, but, um, you know, it can... Oh, God. Well, um, I don't think it really needed to get into the other lane so much uh, as it did. But I guess it's just giving, you know... I guess it just uh, wanted to maintain a bigger margin of safety around the person than I would, but I would just drive very slowly and drive past him. But I guess it's doing the right thing, being cautious about pedestrians, and users can just press the accelerator pedal like I did to force it to go. Um, but what was I saying? Yeah, so, you know, it can... Takeovers are getting more and more rare. Uh, you still often need to give it input to, you know, tell it to go, give it confidence, something like that. But even that's getting less and less. So, autonomy is basically solved. There's no fundamental issues remaining. And, I mean, you, you go in San Francisco and there's tons of Teslas. Many of them are running this software, driving around with computer vision. You see... Waymos and cruises which are driverless in some areas of the city and now they've even started popping up in the daytime too and it's just completely common now to see a car without a driver the debate about whether it's possible is over it's possible we've proven it right you can actually see it you can sit in one and experience it for yourself we don't have to debate oh well can they do this can they do that here it is and Hundreds of thousands of people are using it and it's doing real drives for them every day, getting better at handling more and more challenging situations. And what's more, this is really getting to a level where after almost three years of testing, since they first launched FSD Beta with a few customers, this is finally crossing the threshold where it's comfortable, smooth enough, and reliable enough to be a consumer-level product that an ordinary person can buy. Not just an early adopter who's willing to put up with their car trying to maybe crash into a wall because they want to try the latest and greatest self-driving. New things like the occupancy network and the vision speed network have really provided a much stronger foundation of reliability and safety and given it that experience that, you know, people used to say, oh, my wife won't let me use FSD beta. And so a lot of people are saying, okay, when's it going to pass the wife test? And more people are saying, you know what, um, my wife actually feels more comfortable now with it on, or my wife is actually using it on her Tesla. Um, you know, not to be sexist, wife, husband, whatever, but your partner who's in the front seat who's not in control and uh you know might be appalled by some of the driving decisions of the beta getting it past that threshold where you know if, if your wife won't let you turn it on then 
why are you going to buy it or subscribe to it, right? If you can't even use it. But now if it passes that threshold, if it's super comfortable, super smooth, super reliable, more and more people are going to want to use it even before autonomy, because even though it's not autonomous level reliability yet, I, I might still have to take over if something really weird happens, but it can basically do all my driving for me. And this is obviously a product that consumers are going to want. If there's a car that can do your driving for you, you just punch in in the screen what you want or where you want to go, and the car just takes you there, that is going to be really a redefinition of the product of what a car is and a redefinition of what the market looks like. It's like adding a data plan into a phone. It changes everything. So they're about to launch this. This is 11.4.1. It's based on the 2023 branch. This is finally ready to go out to new users, complete the NHTSA recall, and reopen it up to everybody in, in North America. Um, and I think that people are going to be really um, blown away by what it can do when they try it. And, you know, Teslas have gotten so affordable now, you can get one here in California for $35,000 after incentives before even factoring in fuel savings or anything like that. If you factor in fuel savings, it's really like below $30,000. And, you know, if you get the new SNX, you get unlimited free supercharging. You can get FSD and just have it drive you around wherever you want, unlimited around the country for free. I mean, that's kind of a crazy deal. So a lot of people are going to try this and they're going to want this. And in particular, the highway portion is going to be really, really popular. It's just so much better in, in so many different ways. It's just like, how do I even say it? I mean, the old version is like four years old. It's like going from, you know, 480p to 4K. It's just so much less robotic. It's so much more fluid, so much more human-like. And because autopilot has been included free in every Tesla for some time, pretty much every Tesla owner has used highway autopilot and uses highway autopilot all the time when they're on the highway. So they're very familiar with autopilot. So once start, word starts getting around, once this release happens in the coming weeks, probably before the end of this quarter, it'll be out to all new users. As that gets out and people go, hey, you know there's a brand new version of Highway Autopilot out that's way better. You gotta try it. Oh my God, I tried it on my car and it's like a day and night difference. It fixes so many of those issues I had. And people are gonna say, okay, really, hmm, let me try it. Well, any Tesla you got, you got a Tesla that you know is $35,000 after incentives, the base model. And you can just pay 200 bucks and you got the beta. And you can try it out on your car just like that within minutes. Or if you have enhanced autopilot already, a lot of people have bought the enhanced autopilot package you can pay a hundred bucks and you get it at half price. So it really is actually pretty affordable for, you know, as much as people complain about the $15,000 to roll it into your car, really you just have to pay 200 bucks or a hundred bucks and you can try it out. So a lot of people are gonna try it out. It's really not that expensive. If you can afford a Tesla, you can afford 199 for full self-driving for a month. And of course you're allowed to cancel at any time. So if you try it and you don't think it's worth it, then you just cancel. Or if you just want to use it on road trips or you know certain times when you're driving more, you can do that. You go on vacation for three weeks, you can cancel it that month and not pay. So it's really a pretty good deal. And I think a lot of people are going to take them up on it. I did an estimation and I think it's more than one in four people who have a car that can run FSD beta that are already running it. 
you know, 400,000 users. And I think once they release FSD Beta 11 so that anybody can download it, I wouldn't be surprised to see that number grow by, you know, 50% or more. They'll cross half a million users easily. They could go to 600,000 or more. Um, I don't think it's crazy that they could have a million users using the new FSD beta stack worldwide. Uh, more than a million users by the end of the year. So they're really just collecting data at a scale that's unprecedented. And what does that really mean? I mean, they're practicing. Right? Practice makes perfect. And it's very true in autonomous driving as much as anything. Because how do you really know if your software works? You don't know. You can maybe run a simulation and say, yeah, I think it works. But at the end of the day, you have to actually go out and have it drive around and see if it crashes into anything, right? Or, you know, ideally you don't let it crash. You see if it's going to crash and stop it. Um, so that's what these companies are doing, whether they're Waymo or Cruise or Tesla. They're going out and they're testing their software and they're seeing how much it works. But when you only have a fleet of a few hundred cars, there's really only so much testing you can do. You can do millions of miles of testing if you pay people and do the cars and all that. But it's tough to really get to billions of miles of testing. And that's really what we need for driverless. Like, you know, what do you need to really put your grandma or your mom or dad and someone you love in an autonomous car and with confidence? It's just, well, we've driven this car for, you know, a billion miles or billions of miles. And in those billions of miles, it's never crashed very much except you know maybe a few you know really rare incidents or something like that um, it's you know crashing at half the rate that humans crash so okay well we've tried it you know we've seen all the things that happen in the real world and it works then that's good enough for me right and if you haven't driven those miles then it's hard to really say if it works or not. And as each of those cars goes out there and they drive around, they're discovering all kinds of issues with the software. Issues that we wouldn't necessarily know about if they hadn't gone out there. So every time somebody has a disengagement or they press the accelerator, they change the speed, Tesla's learning something and they can send that data up maybe it'll fire a trigger if they see something that the team is looking for and that data can actually be pulled up and used to augment the training set and make the system better and the other people in the industry you know your waymos your cruises of the world your zooks they don't even know about all the issues they have because they're limited to very specific geographies and so if you're really trying to achieve the holy grail which is a self-driving system that can just work anywhere no matter where you go it can just drive and it knows how to drive everywhere right so this is the self-driving problem a lot of people don't understand this they go Hey, how is it possible that the software works for you, but, you know, in my area I'm having these issues that I'm not seeing in your videos? And it's kind of funny when people ask me this question because the question, I mean, it's kind of backwards that people would assume, well, if it works in one place, it should work in the other place. Because the reality is there's so much variation in the world. There's there's so much difference no two places are really exactly alike and there can be really vast differences between places that are even pretty close by and across the continent there's all kinds of different 
road rules, lane, you know, lane markings, road markings, all kinds of different customs, all kinds of different things happening, different weather phenomenon. Um, it it's really a lot to process, right? We don't see it because we're just driving in our area. We don't really need to drive everywhere every day, but this is a system that needs to know how to drive well all across the country, whether it's rural Wyoming, Manhattan, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Central California, the beach, the forest, a mountain. It needs to handle all of that in the rain, in the sun, at night, at day. So there's really a tremendous amount of variation in the world. And if you can, if you constrain the environment enough, the more you constrain the environment, the easier it gets, right? Because, you know, imagine I say, okay, well, we need to create a self-driving car, but it only needs to be self-driving within, let's say, this small circle, right? Well, then it's pretty easy to build a system that just sort of has that little circle pre-programmed in. and can handle pretty much anything that can happen within that small loop, right? But what's tough is to build something that can work anywhere in any situation with all the variation of the world and with the same car. So you can have one car drive from Los Angeles to New York and everything it encounters in between it can just handle. That's really the holy grail because that's what consumers want. As long as you have these geofence self-driving cars, they're not going to replace their alternatives. They're not going to replace human-driven robo-taxis, and they're not going to replace owning your own car. So what we really need to do is replace owning your own car with owning an autonomous electric vehicle or using an autonomous electric vehicle. And the product has to be better and cheaper. So those are both important points. So if it can't take you everywhere you want to go, it's not better. It's actually more annoying. And you're like, okay, can I go here? Should I, I go in the app and check if I can go to this place? And you'll probably just end up going to Uber or Lyft and using that app instead. Because at least you know that they can take you anywhere. It's a human. And it also needs to be comfortable. It needs to be quick. It needs to do everything as well as the human-driven option. And it needs to do it cheaper. Otherwise, people just use the human-driven option. What's the point? Just for novelty? Just, hey, there's no one in the driver's seat. Well, why does it really matter if I can get someone in the driver's seat and it's cheaper? So most of these cars today, they don't have good unit economics. The products are really limited to the point of being useless. And they're expanding, you know, they're making their service areas bigger at a slow pace, but really getting to something that can drive anywhere across the country, take you anywhere you want. Nobody is really even attempting that. Because their solutions use a lot of HD mapping, which means you really pre-LiDAR scan out the whole place. And then you use a secondary LiDAR scan at runtime to localize your position to a high centimeter. What the fuck was that? Well, so I got in that yellow area to go in the left, which I actually kind of like, because you need to do that here sometimes in California. But then it freaked out because it realized it wasn't supposed to and then tried to get out of the lane and then come back in again when it should have just continued forward. So maybe I'll send that to them. But it wasn't the end of the world. I kind of annoyed the guy behind me a little bit, but you know, it didn't do anything that was too unsafe. So yeah, what was I saying? It's hard to scale because they're using these, a lot of localized data, right? There's a lot of capital cost to go out and send cars and map out these areas. And rather than really just looking at the scene and understanding, 
they're really relying on a lot of contextual information that if it's not correct, then the performance is going to degrade. You look at this system and it's so unique. You know, a lot of people can't tell the difference between these various systems. They see them as just all the same. But what's beautiful about autopilot and FSD is just how little they require. They remove the radar requirement, they remove the ultrasonic requirement. All they have is just these eight cameras pretty much, that's the main input. And I think they have like a GPS and you know other stuff too, but the main thing is it just takes in the eight cameras and it drives just from that. There's no radar, there's no ultrasonic, there's no LiDAR, there's no HD map. It requires so little. And because it requires so little, it works everywhere. It, it can actually take you everywhere you want to go. And this is important because if you think about really what's needed to actually save lives with autonomous driving, you need to displace the usage that's already there with an autonomous car that's safer. And if there's a lot of places that the car can't go, people are going to keep driving themselves certain places or taking human-driven rides, and you're still going to have those crashes. So what Tesla is doing is really important. Coming up with a solution that scales, that can go into millions of cars, and that hundreds of thousands of people are using, millions of people are using legacy autopilot, and soon millions will be using FSD beta too. That's really crucial. And really supporting the full stack from servicing it, getting it repaired, thinking about it all from top to bottom, vertically integrated. Nobody's really made that leap yet. Others are really operating their fleets on kind of like a trial basis. You don't see many other companies deploying their technology to hundreds of thousands of people. Getting it out into a real product that's being mass produced. Supporting, servicing the product, handling, charging, and all these other things. This is really important stuff for actually building out a autonomous ride sharing network of electric cars at scale. There's really no half credit in autonomous cars. It's such a tremendous challenge on so many levels, but you know, let's say you actually solved autonomy and you created this software and it's the perfect driver it dri it's 10 times safer than a human driver and it you know it uses a sensor suite uh, that you built and you know you build a thousand cars that use this and they go around and they're very safe but you never mass produce it well what's your impact people are still going to be dying all over the world at least until the technology gets scaled out they're still going to be driving manually because you just have a thousand cars. So you don't really get half credit for launching it at a small scale. The impact is like a drop in the bucket. To really solve the problem, you need to actually not only solve the software, but solve every piece of it from top to bottom you need to actually mass produce the cars, you need to service the cars, you need to actually run the network and handle all the little problems that aren't necessarily sexy or the things people think about when they think about autonomous cars. The goal here is, you know, what does success look like? Success looks like a world where the majority of people
do not own a car. And if they own a car, they just keep it in their garage or they keep it parked a lot of the time. Their gas powered car or truck and it just sits there. And why? Because there's a fast, affordable, and fun ride sharing network they can call. They can open the Tesla app. There's so many cars that are around that are autonomous. They can work really long hours because there's no human. So you can always get a ride within less than five minutes maybe. And so you never really have to worry about availability, even if it's 2.30 in the morning or something like that, there's always going to be availability. And you call it, it comes, it picks you up, it drives smoother and more comfortable than any Uber you've ever had. And there's a subscription plan you can pay instead of a car payment. Let's say you have someone, you know, an average person, working class person, and their car payment was maybe, you know, two ninety nine. Well, they could maybe subscribe to something for that same two ninety nine, but get these car rides, you know, maybe unlimited rides or they pay a lower price based on each ride they want to do or something like that. But essentially people just sign up for a subscription service rather than paying a car payment. And this basically includes the car insurance, whatever. You could maybe even rent a car for a longer period and take it and keep it overnight if you were willing to pay more for that. But essentially, people just subscribe to a ride-sharing service. There could be maybe higher tiers, maybe a lower tier, you're sharing the car more. Maybe a higher tier, you get to you know, keep the car or whatever overnight. Um, and you can choose how much you want to share it, that kind of thing. So different pricing models will evolve, but it will be a lot cheaper compared to say a car loan and taking out a loan and getting insurance and paying all the costs yourself compared to just signing up for a subscription and getting these really cheap, fast rides anywhere you want to go. You just pull out your phone, boom, a car comes and picks you up. It's smooth, it's fast, it's comfortable. It's safer than any human and it just drops you off and you're on your way. All your information is synced from your Tesla account and it's such a good deal that people go, wait, why do I have a car? Why am I paying, for example, oh, it's getting kind of close to that car. Um, but I guess they were kind of leaning into this lane a little bit. You know, why do I have a car payment for, let's say, five seventy-eight a month and insurance for one fifty a month? And then I'm paying, you know, a few hundred uh, bucks for car washes and I'm paying for new tires. And then I got a registration I got to pay and I got to pay for, you know, all these different things, all these different costs associated with the car. Maybe I got to pay for parking. All this shit adds up. Like, I mean, I don't know if a lot of people really fully add up all the costs of car ownership, but it's, you know, it might be kind of shocking when you look at everything, but people need cars, especially in a city here like Los Angeles. But if you could just get rides anytime you wanted, if you could have a driverless car come and you could keep it for a while if you needed to, um, I mean, why wouldn't people do that? And this is the way I think uh, the market is going to be disrupted. And it's going to be very upsetting to a lot of people because the century-old business model of the car industry where you buy the car is going to fall apart. The structure of the market is going to change a lot. you're not going to see, for example, cars really be as much of something that people just consider a liability where you buy it and it just depreciates and you know, you lose money the second you take that new car off the lot. 
and you know it just depreciates and depreciates until it's worth nothing so maybe you sell it at some point and recoup some of that but it's very subject to what the conditions in the market are as opposed to now cars really become an asset where kind of like a house or an apartment building that you might buy as an investment, it generates cash flow. And it actually generates a predictable amount of cash flow. And you, you can sort of model that out and say, okay, here's the value of this asset for me, just in terms of what's the yield on my investment that I'm making in this car. And so I wouldn't be surprised to see the average selling price of a car in the future actually why the fuck is it stopping here that's not good never did that before um, but anyway can't win them all but um what was I saying I forgot Alright, we got a left turn. It had a chance to go there, it should have gone. Okay, now it has a chance to go. Alright, we got a right turn up ahead. There's a Tesla in somebody's driveway. Oh yeah, I remember what I was saying now. It becomes an asset, it starts producing cash. So, you know, you can really look at it as, okay, here's something that can produce cash for me. Anybody can essentially have a car for free if they're willing to share it. And I think it's going to be really easy to do that and to have different jobs. It won't be just sort of public ride hailing, but there's going to be, I think, various different jobs you could send your car to do. It's sort of like a robot that can go out and do different tasks for you. And so the value is enormous and a lot of people when they're projecting out the future of the auto industry they don't incorporate this kind of stuff at all it's kind of funny they go okay well the auto industry of the future is going to look a lot like the auto industry of today you know similar number of units sold maybe some modest growth there within the realm of reasonableness but nothing really you know too crazy in terms of growth just sort of what you'd expect projecting out the current trends when people don't realize that you know when you can buy a car and it essentially costs you nothing because it can go out and make money for you cars become a lot more affordable even though the sticker price may go up maybe a hundred thousand dollar car you may be only paying on net ten thousand dollars for your use of that car and so a family that had two cars for themselves you know husband a wife with some kids they might get a third car and now their kids can have a car right they got a 14 year old and a 12 year old and the car can come pick them up, take them to school, take them to practice. You know, the dog can have a car. Why not? The dog wants to go somewhere. Why, why can't the dog have a car? And so they'll be able to get in the car and, you know, tap the touch screen and it'll just take them wherever they want to go. You'll have a car that just houses a pizza oven and drives around and makes pizzas for people and 
a robot takes it out and gives it to people. So there will be a car that's bought just for a pizza oven. So when you have the interface of the car changing so profoundly that the market expands to the point where this isn't just for people above driving age anymore, but children, teenagers, pizza oven, dogs, the use cases and the utilization expand so much that it's really not going to look anything like what we've seen in the history of automotive. It's more the history of robotics than the history of automotive. It just so happens that a lot of this stuff is built, being built on top of the existing auto industry because that's sort of a convenient way to do it. Anyway, so there's our drive, another zero takeover drive. Literally every drive has been zero takeover. Have been some inputs, like for example, you saw I had to give that accelerator press there, but for the most part, very good. And I'm sure those little things where it's being overly cautious can be resolved pretty soon. All right, take care. Have a good weekend, everybody, and uh, safe FSD driving out there.